Good evening and welcome to the first of a six part artist curator speaker series titled Platform, an event series of socially engaged artists, collectives and curators in conversation. Today's event is hosted by myself, Michelle Corella Fillmore, the Kellogg and Huntley Galleries curator at Cal Poly Pomona, along with my co hosts and counterparts at Cal State's Northridge and Long Beach, Jim Sweeters and Rebecca Sittler, featuring contemporary artist Beatriz Cortez in conversation with Aaron Cristoval, Associate Curator at the Hammer Museum, Los Angeles. With so many university galleries and museums shuttered by the pandemic, one of the main objectives of this collaborative CSU event is to actively engage all our students, faculty and staff, and communities across the state of California through visual arts-based dialogue via live virtual conversations with contemporary artists, collectives, and curators of note whose work is critical to the current reimaginings of the art world and the world at large. The event series is presented by Consortium, a newly formed collaborative group of CSU art galleries and museums that formed as a result of the pandemic and a deep desire to keep our arts institutions meaningful and impactful in order to better serve our students and communities. For the fall 2020, spring 2021 semesters, Consortium will feature six platform Zoom events with socially conscious contemporary artists, curators, and artist collaborative groups covering important themes that result from current events and trends with speakers that address diversity and inclusion within our arts institutions. The first of these is featured today with three each semester during this academic year. The next fall virtual Zoom events will be on October 22nd at 5.30 p.m and November 12th at noon. Spring 2021 will feature an additional three events in February, March, and April with People's Kitchen Collective, curator Valerie Cassell Oliver, and others with dates and times to be announced. More information on how to register for future, future events will be coming soon to all participating CSU's gallery and museums, mailing lists, website, event listings, and social media posts. Next, please Please also meet Erica Ostrander, Exhibitions Curator at CSUN, who will be overseeing your questions coming in through our webinar Q&A channel. Please see the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. We will be conducting a Q&A towards the latter portion of the webinar event. All attendees are welcome to ask questions of our guest speakers via this method. Please help Erica by asking questions you have um, for either of the speakers as soon as your question comes to mind. This will help keep themes discussed in order for the latter Q&A portion of the event. When doing so, please also indicate which CSU you are affiliated with so we can give your school a shout out. Or if you're a member of the public, indicate that by using the word public. This way we will acknowledge your affiliation while preserving your anim anonymity. We'll try to address as many questions as time allows, but we apologize in advance if we're not able to get to all your questions during the time allotted. We want to also welcome any viewers that are streaming on CPP's YouTube Live or Kellogg University Art Gallery's Facebook Live. We're simultaneously recording this event for post-event access that will be available in approximately two weeks after we finalize this closed captioning for accessibility. We will also make this available through each participating CSU's social media or mailing list. And now for our main event. I would like to introduce our artist and guest speaker, Beatriz Cortez. Born in El Salvador, Beatriz Cortez is a multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles. Her work explores simultaneity, life in different temporalities and versions of modernity, memory and loss in the aftermath of war, and the experience of migration, all in relation to imagining possible futures. She has had LA-based solo exhibitions at the Craft Contemporary Museum, Clock Shop, Vincent Price Art Museum, Monte Vista Projects, and Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana, affiliated with Cal State Fullerton. Shout out to CSUF. She's had solo exhibitions at Centro Cultural de España del Salvador and the Museo Municipal Tecleño El Salvador. Recent group, group exhibitions include In Plain Sight at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, Candeguilla, Cotalicue, and The Breathing Machine at the Ballroom Marfa in Texas. Paroxysm of Sublime at Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, Utopian Imagination at the Ford Foundation Gallery, Mundos Alternos Art and Science Fiction in the Americas at the Queens Museum, 
and Kronos, Cosmos, Deep Time, Open Space at the Socrates Sculpture Park in New York. Recent international shows include Unfolding Universes at the Museo de Arte Moderno de Bogota, Colombia, Ingestion at Teo Retica in San Jose, Costa Rica. In 2018-19, the Kellogg Art Gallery at our Cal Poly Pomona indicated her work in the exhibition uh, or included her work in the exhibition of 24 so SoCal-based artists with diverse backgrounds titled Somewhere in Between, representing the dynamic multi-ethnic and multicultural fabric that is Los Angeles. The shows exhibited themes and artworks helped audiences perceive what it is to be American in a new light while also offering the opportunity to understand the values and perspectives of others different from themselves. So thanks to Beatriz and her gallery representation, Commonwealth and Council for your participation in making that great show for our students at Cal Poly Pomona. Cortez has most recently received the Arts Aldea Los Angeles Award in 2020. The Freeze Life Water Inaugural Sculpture Prize in 2019 the Rema Hortman Foundation Emerging Artist Grant in 2018, and the California Community Foundation Fellowship for Visual Arts in 2016. She holds a Master's in Fine Art from the California Institute of the Arts and a Doctorate in Latin American Literature from Arizona State University. In addition to all this, she teaches at California, at Cal State University Northridge, where she specializes in contemporary Central American literature and cultures from interdisciplinary perspectives. Shout out to CSUN. Beatriz Cortez is represented by one of the most cutting edge and influential galleries in the downtown LA area, mentioned earlier, Commonwealth and Council. So a big thanks to its founder, Young Chung, for bringing Beatriz and many other artists who represent diversity to the forefront in the visual, visual arts. And now, please give a warm welcome to artist and educator, Beatriz Cortez. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, let me start my video so you can all see me. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the CSU Consortium of Museum and Galleries at the different universities in the system for this invitation. In particular, I want to thank Michelle Cairela, Rebecca Sittler, and the team at the University Art Galleries at Cal Poly Pomona for inviting me to speak at this event today. I also want to thank the rest of the organizing team, um, the Kleefeld Art Museum at Cal State Long Beach, and um, the gallery that is at my home university that I know the best and that I benefit from all the programming, the team at the Season Art Galleries, particularly its director, Jim Sweeters, and Erica Ostrander, who's the exhibitions coordinator there. I have had the opportunity to work with each of them, like Michelle said, and in particular, in the particular case of our home, our galleries to enjoy each of the exhibitions that they have created for us in the last 20 years. And so it is an honor for me to have this opportunity to speak in this forum that they have created for our students, our faculty, and the general public. I also want to thank Erin Cristobal from the Hammer Museum for being here and being part of this forum. It is such an honor to share this space with you. Thank you. I want to dedicate this presentation to the memory of Brianna Taylor and to the justice that we have yet to build in the future. The first work that I ever placed outdoors was a monument to the women whose bodies were discarded in war and in migration in different contexts, but quite in a similar way. I wanted this unknown body to be honored and I decided to turn the body into a garden. I made a body with wire, with soil, and I filled it with seeds and I watered it and visited, cared for it for a period of about three months. The experience of caring for this sculpture was important because this work gained meaning by being placed outdoors, gained meaning by being exposed, by being vulnerable, but also it taught me a lot about how we can care for the things that are exposed and vulnerable and how we can symbolically and literally care for the others. Um, the body was also made of earth in the process of becoming, becoming a garden 
becoming part of um, going back, returning to the earth. My work, which in many cases has emerged from my collaboration with others, is also interactive. In the case of this work, The Fortune Teller, which I made in collaboration with a Maya Kachikel collective called Kajai Moloch in Patricia in Guatemala, um, public interactions with my work often link to, are linked to play, to the experience of joy, and as a way to step outside modern reason and fixed ideas about time and space, um, through play, we can move across time and space and we can um, move out, step outside Western reason. And uh, in this case, we were able to circulate the desires of a community that were programmed into the Arduino as desires, as wishes for the future, and um, give them back as gifts of generosity to others, each time in a different temporality, each time gaining new meanings, recirculating wisdom, etc willing the future into being. Today, I also want to speak in particular about placing my works in public space, because during this pandemic and after the murder of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many others, it has become visible that what has been, I mean, it has become visible to most, what has been visible to black, brown, indigenous people for generations. There is a historic revisionism that is pervasive in public space, making our histories, our ancestors, our technologies and forms of knowledge, our materials and our perspectives invisible in public space. My work engages with the concept of nomadism or the nomad. And really it doesn't only think about nomadism in terms of space, but in terms of identity, in terms of time, and in terms of all these other ideas that lead us to movement and towards the future. It questions the idea of permanence because of all that, and instead of embracing becoming change and transformation, I mean, instead it embraces all those things in life in motion and constant movement and um, not a solid destination, nor a rigid identity that needs to be formed or rescued but something that is in the process of um, being made constantly. Um, it questions the, the concept of permanence in terms of space, contra contrary to an executive order issued by the White House on July 3rd that claims that monuments are permanent. It claims that sculptures have to be realistic too. Um, my work is filled with abstraction, but also filled with abstraction that goes back to ancient indigenous cultures and filled with abstraction that is um, made by materials that are very familiar in the daily practices and the labor of immigrant communities. Um, but my work is about being a nomad, about stating how nothing is permanent. So ideas about the construction about the construction of things, of structures, or construction in general from nomadic perspectives are important for my work. With materials such as black lava that you saw before and rocks from the ice age that you see here, we are here um, seeing a marker made with rocks from Kettle Moraine. And um, these rocks are potentially from the ice age. These are rocks that reveal other temporalities on earth before humans existed on earth that foretell global warming and foretell our destruction. But at the same time, working with these rocks is a declaration of our survival. And, um, and so, as in the case of this collaboration with Rafa Esparza, Portal Sur after Copan in Ballroom Marfa, it was made with adobe. These materials are organic, irregularly shaped, and the constructions are impermanent, speaking about nomadism because they are held together by the planet or by gravity or because they are made of earth. And so when I began to work later on with steel, I began to work with steel thinking of this idea that, that steel is also an organic material that came from the earth. I wanted to show you here a photo of one of the wonderful teams of artists who worked on the making of this sculpture inspired by the Maya archways in Copan. 
Sandro Canova, San Adobero Basin Marfa, and three other artists, Sebastián Hernández, Rubén Rodríguez, and Timo Faller, who's not in the photo, worked with Rafa and I in the making of this sculpture. Here we see also Matt Grant was in charge of installations at Ballroom posing with us for this photo. There's a very important person missing in this photo, Don Manuel Rodriguez, a master adobero who taught us so much and who made the adobes that we use for this work. Um, with the earth that he found around his house on the other side of the border in Ojinaga. His adobes were allowed to cross the border for, making, for the making of this work, even though we had a very difficult time um, doing that with Rafa. Sorry, something's happening that my images are moving. Um, but his adobes were allowed to go across the border for, for the making of this work, but he was not allowed to go across the border and attend the opening. And he died not long after the exhibition so I wanted to mention how important it has been for my art practice to work with teams of amazing artists and talented non-artists coming together to improvise, to make visible through their labor something that is not frequent, our labor telling our own stories, our labor breaking down chronologies, our labor breaking borders. A lot of the people who have collaborated with me in the making of my work are immigrants people of color and women. Our labor is often employed to tell stories that render us invisible. And so it has been beautiful for me to make large scale work, to make our labor visible. It has been beautiful for me to collaborate with others such as Rafa. Solkin at the Hammer. Well, this, this piece was part of the exhibition made in LA 2018 exhibition and um, I made this piece in two, in two parts, one at the Hammer and one at the LA River. It was a really important piece for me in my own process of understanding all these things and um, because it allowed me the opportunity to place my work outside of the space of the museum. At the museum, which you see here, it included a moving sculpture called Piercing Garden that is in the back with all those um, stems with tiny gardens. And it included also um, Solkin, which you see in the middle of the space, um, inspired by the Maya calendar for agriculture in a box that you see on the right, you only see this black box on the right, that um, it, it contained a video feed that allowed visitors to see what had been going on with another slightly larger but similar sculpture installed at the bow tie by the LA River at the border of a water village, Cypress Park, and just north of Lincoln Park. I met Erin as she was curating the show with Ann Elwood. I did not have a studio at the time. I was working in my garage. I had works in my kitchen, in my dining room, and in my living room. I remember Erin engaging with the works and laughing out loud, out loud with joy. And I remember her call a couple a couple of weeks later, she said, we have visited about 300 artists and I'm calling to invite you to participate in the Made in LA exhibition. This was an important moment in my career. And just before that, uh, almost like 10 days before, Julia Meltzer from Clock Shop had visited my studio and commissioned a new work for the LA River at the site known as the Bow Tie. This is, this was how I first imagined Solkin. I, I had imagined it as a single standing sculpture. And so when Erin and Anne inv invited me to participate in Made in LA, I asked them and, who, and Julia if they would consider collaborating so that I could make a work that would be connected conceptually and symbolically across the city, 22 miles from each other from the Hammer Museum to the Bow Tie. They all said yes. It was amazing because this experience forced me to think a lot about what it means to show your work at the museum, at the institutional space that's protected, protected and um, guarded, and to show your work at a more, more, more vulnerable location, such as a vacant lot that used to be a railroad yard by the LA River, but at the same time, a place that was more accessible to some of the communities that don't see themselves um, 
as part of the museum culture and or have never been to a museum and don't know how it is um, or don't have time to go to the museum. So Tzolki is based on the ancient Mayan calendar for agriculture, but because of this, it was also the calendar that was used to determine sacred dates um, to, to carry out ceremonies and to foretell people's futures, a horoscope of sorts. I was fascinated by this calendar, not only because of its cyclical understanding of time, but also because of its futurity. The ancient Maya had an understanding of time that was cyclical. So Tzolkin um, is based on this ancient Mayan calendar for agriculture, but because of this, it's also this calendar that has this futurism embedded in it. And I was fascinated by this calendar because it had this cyclical understanding of time that had short counts and long counts of time. And um, that allowed me then to imagine temporalities that were really long that existed before humans had been on earth and that and some temporalities that were really short and that allowed um, me to imagine other possibilities. So oftentimes um, their calendars in drawings and in, um, in codices were represented as a sort of gear set. And this also inspired my work and inspired me in making this piece. The gears that in the sculpture generate a hypocycloidal motion that is at once circular as the inner gear moves around the interior of the ring gear. There's a point, each one of the teeth is also moving in a linear motion as it's spinning around this gear. And so they produce a linear motion and a circular motion at once, exploring simultaneity in the way um, creating a metaphor that was very resonant to the work that I had been making thinking about simultaneity. And so the sculptures were placed pointing at each other. This sculpture was looking towards the hammer and the sculpture of the hammer looking at this one and um, placed here at the east side of the river looking towards the river. The sculptures allowed me to think about the disparate realities that one inhabits within one same city. Ideas about segregation, separation, but also the works also allowed me to build a metaphor about migration and about how two beings sustain a bond, how they remain linked to each other, connecting, connected through the distance across time and space. Later on, I had the opportunity to install the sculpture on the grounds of Occidental College. And um, this is what you see here, the quad at Oxy, and later on at the Socrates Sculpture Park in New York, where the larger sculpture was overlooking the East River, while the smaller one was pointing towards the larger one in a similar gesture, crossing a, um, the entire park and evoking a connection through the distance as beings that belong together, but yet are separated. For me, it was very important to have the opportunity to place these works here in this neighborhood where my parents lived as young immigrants from El Salvador about 50 years be earlier, before they went back to El Salvador, before I was born. During those years, there wasn't any art that could speak of their experiences in these spaces. They moved around them, immigrants making a new life in the city as they thought about their family back home, but placing this work by these rivers in my attempt to honor the Maya was difficult for me because just as I was installing the work by the LA River, a young Maya woman by the name of Claudia Gomez Gonzalez was shot and murdered by the border, a border patrol officer. She was unarmed. She had crossed the river, the Rio Grande, and she was supposed to be protected by the laws of this country by then. But we know that the, laws, the law does not protect bodies of color. And like in the case of Breonna Taylor, no one paid for her murder. There was no justice. These events forced me to think about the word monument as they connected with them through the technology available to them at the time, mostly telegrams, Apache way to connect with each other, but a way to sustain love and family through space and time. In my imaginary, these two sculptures were doing something that I had seen my parents do in different moments in time. Um, at the same time, it forced me to think about monument to the things that are invisible, to that practice of patching together your family, 
to the experience of living your life knowing that a loved one was killed and that there was no justice. So I decided to make a monument for Claudia Gomez Gonzalez, and I was able to place it virtually in the area where she was murdered, thanks to my collaboration with and the work of an amazing artist who I'm sure is not here today, because she's also giving a talk at the same time as ours, Nancy Baker Cahill. Nancy developed the fourth wall app, which allowed me to install the work in augmented reality very close to the place where Claudia Gomez Gonzalez was murdered. However, this would never have been possible without the collaboration of another person whom I have never met. Rosa del Carmen Contreras Ramos, director of the Centro Cultural de Nuevo Laredo in Mexico, just south of the border from Laredo, Texas. I found her by recommendation of a fellow artist, Hector Hernandez, who had lived in Laredo, in Nuevo Laredo, sorry. And I wrote to her and I explained, I wanted to honor Carmen Go Gomez Gonzalez. I want to honor her too, she said. And she went to the border with her daughter, Monica, a fellow artist, to photograph the work until we were convinced that it was in the middle of the river and that it would be a beautiful homage to her. I am very grateful for all the collaborators and supporters known and unknown who believe in the messages and in the content that my works carry forward and who have contributed in enormous ways to make them possible. Now let me move back to the LA River because I want to show you other works that I have also installed or photographed there, there, there in this case. This cosmic dream or cosmic beds, I made them for my first solo museum exhibition, Trinidad Joy Station at the Craft Contemporary. And particularly, these beds were also conceived as an homage to the children in detention centers whose situation and isolation has been invisible to us on the outside. These beds, titled um, Cosmic Dream Together, were made with materials available to the children. Mylar blankets, chain link, steel fences. Like I often do before opening the show, I took the works to the LA River, and with the help of Tatiana Guerrero, who's my right hand at the studio, and uh, my friend Carolina, who's a writer from El Salvador, Holly Jerger, who's the curator of the exhibition, and others from the museum, we took the works in a truck and installed um, them in the space just so that we could see them outdoors. The works for Trinidad Joy Station brought together ideas about collective living, disaster, diversity, but also survival in hostile environments. Through that work, I was able to imagine not only more contemporary designs for geodesic domes made of car hood sections, but also ancient ways of building structures that are geodesic domes as well. Moving across temporalities, I was able to question what is part of modernity if we overlook the patents that Buckminster Fuller was able to secure. My work was also inspired and gave visibility to ancient indigenous forms of construction, ways of organizing, collective living, and survival. Moved across the present and towards the future, they invite viewers to think of the options for collective survival that we have yet to build. The same with Generosity One, a space capsule that carries with it seeds for the survival of the humans of the future, but seeds that were domesticated and developed for the survival of the amazing civilizations of the Americas. Photographing it at this industrial apocalyptic site does not allow me to know if it is coming or going, if it is landing or taking off if it is a gift of generosity that we are sending from the present and from the past towards an unknown other, towards an unknown future, or if it's a gift of generosity that others have sent to us. This idea of generosity, of connecting with, with unknown others across time and space is fundamental to my work. This summer when the pandemic started, I had the opportunity to participate as one of the artists and in plain sight, a coalition of 80 artists who were paired with immigration detention centers, the, the corporations that profit from them or the immigrant detec detention system in general. It was an amazing um, work of art, of collective work of art organized by two artists, Rafa Esparza and Castles here in Los Angeles and an amazing team of organizers, volunteers, and activists. It was hard for me to decide what to write. 
Each phrase had to be only 15 characters long and each of us had so much to say. When the pandemic began, it was clear to me that for us immigrants dispersed around the globe at different locations under the jurisdiction of different nations, for the decades that Central Americans have, li have lived divided by borders, um, we really have been under quarantine and we have had to communicate through different um, forms of technology, but communicating through the sky was particularly beautiful for me because it evokes the ancient indigenous ways of communicating through smoke puffs of sacred copal and other sacred forms of um, producing sacred smoke. So that was a beautiful opportunity um, for me. And I wanna show you some images of that work. Um, no cages, no howlas. My message um, was chosen because our communities have suffered one of the most despicable acts, the separation of children from their families. Our children are being held in the refrigerated cages, surrounded by chain link, covering their bodies with mylar blankets, growing up alone, feeling abandoned without being able to satisfy their most basic needs physically and spiritually. They need to be released so that their families who love them and miss them and their communities can be made whole again and we can start to heal. So I wanna show you very quickly, my pain is so big, was written by the sister of the first detained immigrant who died of COVID, who was a Salvadoran. This is in Brooklyn. This is in Laredo, it's not your fault, Sky Hupinka. This is Bambi Salcedo over MacArthur Park, stop immigration now. Your tax dollars cage kids, that's you next. Henry, La Frontera nos cruzó, Rafa Esparza. No more camps, Karen Ishizuka. Shame, defund hate. This is castles above the GEO Group headquarters who profit from the detention centers. The map that shows the different locations where this was made. But I wanted to quickly also mention that the the, my work in, uh, in Plain Sight also gave me the opportunity to work with community organizations from Central America, such as Carecen, Clinica Romero, El Rescate, Sales, and Dilon. And together, um, we had lots of conversations, voting, and the community organizations decided that they wanted to amplify their message, defund eyes on the street, and so I wanted to enable them to make this message. And what I did is post lots of notes, contact lots of friends, and um, we gathered a lot of volunteers, some who did amazing work, amazing amount of work, and everybody came super early in the morning, and this is next to MacArthur Park. We were able not only to write the font eyes, but to also draw the Wipalas, which are the two flags that you see on the two sides that are, um, symbol of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And so I wanted to show you this work and also another work that the community organizations authored during In Plain Sight. Um, they decided that in order to give visibility to indigenous people from Central America, because Central American people um, are very diverse and, um, you know, I myself have a problem um, stating that um, Central America is Latinx because Central America has Black people and Indigenous people and not only um, people who are descendants of the Hispanic tradition and I don't like to erase or contribute to their visibility. So um, the communities decided to write a message in Quiche over the border from one of the planes, and then with the help of Nancy Baker Cahill and Young Chong, who went to help install the work, and they also installed an augmented reality version that has been left permanently over the lake in MacArthur Park. And so if you ever go there, just download your fourth wall app. It's a free app, and you can see the work that says in Kiche, Makaka Sheikh Taqib meaning we will not be afraid. And they decided to say we will not be afraid because 
also for them, you know, it was an invitation to imagine a safe future for indigenous peoples from Central America and Mexico and for, for all. And the use of this language is a statement of the survival of the Maya people, particularly the Quiche, who are the majority of the indigenous immigrants from Central America, Los Angeles and the United States. So I, um, I don't have a lot of time left. So I wanted to very quickly show you some images of my newest work. Um, glacial erratic, which I made inspired by the landscape in New York City, because the landscape in New York City has these huge boulders, and the content of these huge rocks that are so familiar to everybody who lives in New York, because they have been um, here the entire era of humans, but um, these rocks have been moved and they have different mineral content, they're foreign to this landscape, and they have been moved here um, thousands or millions of years before. Um, and so they speak of the, the ways in which migration is not only human, but also planetary and also millinery and also natural. And it includes animals and it includes rocks and it includes the planet as a whole, which is in flow. And so I decided to propose for the free sculpture prize um, placing a uh, glacial erratic in front of Rockefeller Center. And I received that commission. And so that allowed um, me to, to draw all the sections of this rock and with working with a team of artists that included Tatiana and included uh, Carla Canseco, Noe Olivas, Maria Meia, and also included um, Cece Krebs. Uh, and later on, um, Andre Kachian and um, some of the people who taught me how to weld. But then later, when we had to dismantle the, the sculpture, it also required for all of us to be very careful about COVID. And so we had to come back to the studio and to put together the this, this sculpture working only with our communities. And so, for example, my friends, Douglas, Carranza and Elizabeth Perez Marquez, they worked um, on this project from their home. And also um, Tatiana's entire family, her roommates, all the people that were already close to us so that we wouldn't have to break the quarantine. And so one day at three in the morning, I stood in the parking lot looking at all these people, some of them my alumni, some of them my colleagues, some of them my friends, some of them her family, and I thought, wow, you know, it's always the same community. I have seen these people for the last 12 years standing together during the bad times and the good times, and there's so many memories that we have together that it was so beautiful and so difficult not to start to cry thinking what, a, what amazing um, gift we have with our community. And what amazing gift to be able to employ the labor of our community to tell our stories together. And so um, these are the different sections of that rock that um, later on um, we sent to Rockefeller Center and is currently on view there until October 2nd, so next week. So thank you so much for listening. And I want to stop talking so that we can have a conversation with Erin. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. My name is Jim Sweeters. I'm the director of the CSU Northridge Art Galleries. We are excited to co-host this first lecture and conversation in the platform series, particularly because Beatrice has been a respected member of the CSU and faculty for more than two decades. I'm also delighted to keep this conversation in the neighborhood, so to speak, by introducing Aaron Cristoval. Aaron is the associate curator at the Hammer Museum here in Los Angeles and co-founder of the experimental film program, Black Radical Imagination with Amir George. When we invited Beatrice to, the first, to be the first artist in the series for the lecture, we discussed the format and thought bringing in a notable curator who was familiar with Beatrice's work would expand the conversation. Aaron was excited about our invitation and honored to participate in the discussion. Having curated her into the 2018 edition of Made in LA at the Hammer. Please help me welcome Aaron Cristoval in conversation with Beatrice Cortez.
Hello. Hi, Beatrice. Thank you. thank you, Jim. And hello, Erin. Um, thank you to the CSU Consortium and thank you to dear Beatrice for um, inviting me to be in conversation. Um, Beatrice's work has taught me so much about my curatorial practice and has also continued to challenge me and evolve me in ways that I'm just forever grateful for. So thank you, Beatrice. Um, I just, I want to start off by talking about Made in LA because, you know, this was the first time that we worked together and the first time I really got to know Beatrice and her work. Um, one thing I'll say about Beatrice is Beatrice is an exceptional scholar and is always gathering knowledge in ways that I find inspiring and in ways in which Beatrice, you know, looks at the canon of academia and breaches it um, through these ways in her artwork. Um, but I want to talk about Tolkien and Pearson Garden and what their presence was like at the Hammer because um, there is a really important institutional critique that was happening during the run of that show um, in that, you know, Tolkien, this incredible piece, um, this monumental figure that basically witnessed the viewers through these three months over the summer, um, was something that I engaged with every day, something that I greeted every day. And I think what's so interesting about museums is, you know, museums come out of a tradition, um, a tradition that stems from um, collecting uh, more times than not looting cultural objects um, from black and brown countries and communities. Um, in a more encyclopedic sense. And so I think that um, something that Tolkien and Pearson Garden did is they actively were disrupting these traditions and challenging us, I think, as museum workers to think differently about objects and how to take care of them. Um, something amazing about Tolkien was that over the course of three months, it started to rust and it gained this really beautiful, bright amber color. And, you know, I think the registrars, who are the folks who are constantly checking up on the work to make sure it's, it's functioning and, you know, it's, it's presentable, I think this presented an interesting challenge because work is not supposed to quote unquote dirty or soil itself. You know, we're supposed to take care of it. We're supposed to clean up everything. And so to see this piece naturally and organically rusting, um, transitioned from this notion of being problematic or soiled and actually transitioned into this marker of time. It was a new way to understand time, the way in which the rust was slowly climbing up the metal. Um, and then also thinking about piercing garden and that it was piercing, <laughs> you know, it, it turned off and on, um, it operated, it was, you know, this, uh, functional piece and it was right in front of our bookstore. So it created this loud sort of clashing metal sound when it was activated. And I thought that that was a really brilliant way of also disrupting the museum space, you know, that's supposed to be quiet so viewers can see the artwork and think about it. Um, but it was making a statement that, you know, I'm here, I'm growing, and that um, the plants that I'm growing are the seeds of the Americas. Um, and just to quickly go back to Tolkien, something that was beautiful to me was thinking about the relationship that the piece at the hammer and the piece at the bow tie were having. You know, on one hand, you have the piece at the hammer that's institutionalized in a sense. You know, it's within the museum walls. It exists within the art historical canon. Um, it you know is a part of that tradition. Whereas the piece in clock shop was unhinged, it was with nature, it operated on its own time, it was powered even by the sun. And I thought that these two pieces together were a representation of the westernized subject, right? That we are both 
of and that we are um, mixed with so many different diasporas, communities, and people. And I just felt, found that really compelling. Um, so anyways, uh, I think Beatrice, I wanted to just start off in thinking about public art because um, I think your way of thinking through public art is so expansive. And I think a lot of us have a lot of preconceived notions about what public art is and can be and how we can engage with it. It's often sort of, you know, uh, overseen by, you know, civic bodies. And I think you're constantly breaking that mold. Um, you're thinking about public objects as temporary and you're also expanding the notion of audience. You know, we usually think of humans just engaging, passing through public artwork, but you're putting your work in places that humans may not even show up to, you know? And then I start to think, well, audience can extend beyond that, thinking about how nature engages with your work, thinking about how the elements of this earth engage with your work. So can you tell us a bit more about your philosophy on this notion of public art? Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if I'm thinking of it as public art, just like you're saying in terms of, um, first of all, I'm not thinking about it in terms of permanence, but I'm thinking about it in terms of nobanism. I'm not thinking about it in terms of a commission that's necessarily given I mean, sometimes I have obtained a commission, like in the case of the Rockefeller Center or in the case of um, clock shop, but, um, but it's not a commission that is given to an artist to make a large scale work that will remain permanently, that has undergone all this consultation or maybe all this um, banning, you know? Instead, um, what I what I have done in my opinion is imagined um, a large scale sculpture because before that I began making spaceship. So the way that I began working with metal was almost as in I wanted to imagine immigrants and I wanted to imagine indigenous people as part of the future. And I wanted them to be able to imagine flying to space and being in the cosmos and um, they don't have access to SpaceX and they cannot um, buy a ticket to go to space because they're too expensive. So it was like a gesture of, you know, those, those spaceships in SpaceX are made with our labor anyway, we can make this. And, um, and you know, and this effort to make, um, a spaceship symbolically, right? With sections and panels that fit in my car that I can lift, that women um, in my studio can lift, or maybe sometimes in the case of this last sculpture, we have to live together, but, but still we can manage, you know, and that allow us to just finding an, an amazing way to make this sculpture come together because the, the, the part about the sculpture that's right now at Rockefeller Center is that because it's not geometric, it's very difficult to put it together, um, to imagine drawing these things in the air and making them match. So that like almost a magic of being able to create a system that works and that brings these sections together so that we can work on them as sections that we can handle and that we don't require having a huge factory or a huge corporation behind us and that with our labor we can make large-scale monuments and place them somewhere and with our labor we can take them apart and move them, move them across from one coast to the other coast of the United States or that with our labor in one case with Rafa we drew the information for somebody else and other laborers like our, like us made the work, replicated the work in Colombia. Like this idea that our work rather than being a patent that we hide is shared and multiplied like molecules, like, like, like a virus is, is more interesting to me. And so that's, 
you know, how I began to imagine these monuments and these large scale sculptures because I needed to believe that we can do this because we do it for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that, you know, what you're doing is you're really um, sort of reimagining these notions of, I think, the infrastructure that we exist around. And I think one of the, one of the ways in which you're doing that is in how metal is sort of one of the centerpieces in terms of material that you use. And I wanna just explore that a bit because, you know, when I think of metal, I, I think of permanence, you know, it's supposed to be this material that builds a structure that is supposed to exist forever, even beyond me as a human being, right? Um, and so I think it's interesting that there's, there's, a, there's a temperance to this, but also that, um, you know, I think about metal and I think about its qualities, you know, it has these reflective surfaces, it's shiny, it inhibits optical illusion, and that's the magic of it. And sort of the cosmicness that I think you're bringing into that material consistently in your work. So can you speak to us a bit about that material in particular and why you continue to use it in your practice? Yeah, it's a complicated material. It's a really good question because, you know, one could say, well, this material is polluting the earth and we should not be using this material. And at the same time, um, you know, this is like, I'm imagining how other people 100 years ago said, um, let's use river rock from Tohunga Wash because that's the local material that we have. And we could tell them right now, don't use the rocks from Tohunga Wash. You're going to finish all the rocks, you're going to deplete this environment, you should not do it. But the thing is that, that that still is our local material now, and it's a commentary on the industrialization of Los Angeles, but at the same time, uh, it's, um, it's a statement about how I don't believe in, in permanence. And, um, you know, we go buy a car, we go out, we park our car in the sun, et cetera. And in two years, it's already not looking very shiny anymore. And, you know, we are coating the metal so that its aging process can be delayed, but it's still happening. And so I refuse to coat the metal and I refuse to um, act as if it were dead. I, I am really interested in the life of the metal and how it reacts to the atmosphere because I'm interested in exploring ideas about how through the atmosphere we are, the atmosphere is showing us how white supremacy is impossible because it's untenable because we're breathing each other, bodies are permeable. And if COVID hasn't taught us that, well, I don't know what to say. I mean, we're breathing each other, you know? And so um, there's something important that the atmosphere is saying and the atmosphere impacting the metal is reminding us how modernities crumble and they might crumble faster or slower than us, but they still crumble. And so by not believing in those modernities and displacing them from the center of the narrative, then I'm interested rather in motion, in becoming, and what we are turning into in the process of transforming ourselves. Mm. But I wanted to take advantage of the fact that you're here and ask you about being a curator in Los Angeles because I think you know there's also this um, really important moment in which we also need people curating the shows for um, the artists that represent the diverse population of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, being an artist, I, I have been really blessed by having the support of so many curators, um, so many curators from so many different groups and backgrounds and different institutions that have believed in my work and helped me um, make, create it and make a reality what I was imagining. And, and so I wanted to know, you know, what your experience is and what you think is, how, how does, does one handle this responsibility? Because it's also almost like you can imagine 
things into being or you can be a gatekeeper and not imagine things into being right you can say this is too much noise you have to quiet this noise for this piece or you can say let's disrupt this space and and you're in the middle of negotiating between the artist and the institution and it's um, an interesting place to be to say the least and i think it's an important moment to be doing that and so i would love to know more well, how much time you got? <laughs> um, no, I, I really appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, it's a funny job. I mean, you know, I think I'll say this, uh, you know, Made in LA was really important to me because, you know, I, I grew up in Long Beach. Um, so, you know, I've lived in LA County all my life. And so, I really took that exhibition to be a love letter, you know, to my county and to the city. And the most important thing for me in that show was that I wanted this show to reflect the artists and the communities of this city and not the diversity standards of the art world, which I feel are very different. I feel like the art world has such a narrow understanding of diversity and I think this city is one of the most multicultural, incredible cities in the world. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that this city does not exist without black and brown folks. I'm thinking about Pio Pico, I'm thinking about Biddy Mason, some of the founders of this city that um, don't get historicized in the way that they should um, and who have built up this city for people like you and me. And so I always keep the legacy of people like that in mind. Um, I think, you know, the hammer is a free institution. And so what that makes me believe as a curator is that, um, you know, my hope is that anyone will feel welcome here. Um, and that I, because this is a cultural institution for the city that actually it's my civic duty. Like I'm actually like a civil servant, um, more so than a curator to, to sort of facilitate this space. So I, you know, um, I think when we were thinking about the artists, I couldn't help but think about the legacy of Central American folks in this city. Um, specifically thinking about El Salvador, specifically th thinking about the Civil War and how many people came to Los Angeles in the 80s and the early 90s um, and what that cultural impact meant to the city. And so um, it was historical for you to be in that show. Um, I think we had talked about it and I don't know if this is correct, but I think you might be the first contemporary artist, um, woman, um, Salvadorian woman in at the Hammer. Um, and so that was very emotional, you know, and uh, it's just important to represent everyone because the city, that's what the city is, you know. So I think, you know, the more institutional part of being sort of this person between the artists and the institution is, it's interesting because I think, and this is something that I think actually Anne Elgood, who co-curated the show, taught me, is like how to really care for artists. And so, you know, when Pearson Garden was going off, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think there, there's definitely some behind the scenes conversation about, you know, what, what what's this noise that's like echoing throughout the galleries and are we okay with that? But, you know, I think ultimately it's like, uh, a curator's job is to support artists and be a caretaker of objects. Um, and so that's what we do. And I think if that was your vision, you know, we couldn't stray away from that, so. No, I, I really appreciate uh, what you're saying because uh, also my experience in, in the art world in Los Angeles has been one where um, you know, many of the, the ways in which we have, um, in my, in my own life, like we have, I have overcome a lot of the spaces of intentional segregation of people, you know, that has been through the art world and through my collaboration with other artists and through 
my participation in um, Commonwealth and Council and, um, you know, just collaborating with other artists who are from Korea, from, from the Chicano community, from uh, Black artists that are here in the city. I mean, this city has tried to segregate us and separate us and um, I just feel like the contemporary art world has um, done something different and that's very beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think our existence stems from a legacy that's not so um, long ago. You know, I think about the collaborative work that you're consistently doing with folks like um, Rafa and Maria and Noe and so many others. And I think about the histories of Studio Z and also the histories of OSCO. You know, these were two collectives um, who are in different parts of the city who came together from time to time, but who were actively thinking about um, creating their own spaces because the museums that be were not advocating for them, were not inviting them in. So these groups actively performed um, outside, you know, in different places. And again, I think this comes back to this idea of, you know, um, these temporary actions, you know, that exist only for those who are there in the moment. And then also I think about, again, material, specifically the organic material you use and how those groups were thinking so much about everyday material to make their work. So material that wasn't necessarily gonna stand the test of time um, because that's just what they had access to. And so I think, you know, now we've shifted into a different conversation where the institutions have invited us in, but I think that the work you do still honors the legacies of black and brown collectives, art collectives in this city um, who have been staging these things for years. Well, and right now I'm collaborating with Kang Song Lee. Um, we have been friends for a really long time. And one of the, you know, the intellectual efforts that both of us are making as we're putting together, I mean, bringing our works together to the space as our, our show is gonna open at 18th Street um, next month is to think about, you know, the points of coincidence of, um, of, the, of the bodies of work that we're making and how we're both talking not only about the invisibility of some people, but also about becoming and about this constant transformation and reinventing identities rather than defining an identity. So rather than defining a Central American identity or a Salvadoran identity, um, as others have done in the past, for us is an effort to imagine um, becoming atmosphere, which is what we're exploring in this exhibition. And I think, um, you know, in that sense, I see that effort to collaborate uh, difficult and important and breaking barriers that need to be broken so that we can sit down and think together. And so I feel so fortunate to have had so many opportunities to collaborate with um, so many amazing artists. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, moving against this, these pre-described identities, I think is so important and groundbreaking and really, I think, roots us in the now, right? <laughs> because I think this year has um, shown all of us that, you know, nothing is normal, uh, nothing is defined, nothing is fixed, rather everything can be broken, dismantled, reimagined, um, and so, you know, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Arundhati Roy was really talking about this notion of a pandemic portal. Um, and I see so many incredible artists and creatives sort of um, leaning into this portal and thinking anew. And I think that's something you've consistently done throughout your practice is how can I reimagine, rethink, or uh, push forward these notions even more. And that's what I really, really appreciate because, you know, so often I think um, we, we get pushed into um, a prescribed identity by the art world. And 
uh, further by way of white supremacy, right? We don't have, um, or, you know, they, they sort of push this notion on us that we don't have the agency to define ourselves. Um, and the ways in which that shows up in the art world can be very violent and problematic and oftentimes box really incredible artists into these small boxes in which they can only exist in. And so I think that the fact that you're constantly disrupting that is, is so important. Um, and I think such an example for so many artists. Thank you. For me, it has been very difficult um, to, de to navigate that because um, oftentimes, I mean, not, all, not always art institutions as much as people who write about art, for example, um, insist on reading my work as the work of a Salvadoran immigrant. And it is the work of a Salvadoran immigrant, but my work is about so much more and it surpasses me. And by reading it as a stereotype of the identity that they're imagining that I'm supposed to carry, uh, by imposing ideas such as feminist work or immigrant work or um, Latinx work, et cetera, they are um, narrowing the ways in which it can be read when my work speaks about so many different histories. And, um, you know, I have works that are, are about the Lakota and about the Japanese mm -hmm. and about um, so many different groups of people, they're not about me, that have lived in other eras, in other moments, in other spaces. So that's, to me, really important um, to try to navigate. Even if I have to explain it a million times, I always say to people, you know, I don't, um, I don't consider myself a feminist. I don't consider myself a woman. I don't consider myself an immigrant. Even though I am all those things, because I'm trying to convey, could we please step outside from my own identity and really look at the work? Don't worry about me. I'm not going with the sculpture. The sculpture is going by itself. Right, you know? right. So, no, I think the, the way your strategy with that is really, you really turned to, um, I think, you know, sacred geometry comes up so much in your work. Um, these geometric shapes that are prescribed by nature show up so much in your work and really just an overall honoring of um indigenous technologies you know um that i think paved the way for western technologies um and the resources as well the natural resources and uh i really appreciate that because i feel like every work that you present provides a history lesson, you know, a, a history that we're not given typically. Um, and I think, you know, every work is a, is a point of departure for education. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I'm I, sorry, we jump in here now so we can get a few questions from the students. But thank you, Beatrice and Erin, for such an amazing conversation. I honestly really regret to interrupt you. Thank you, Erica. Hi. <laughs> um, so one of the things that came up is, um, how do you think that tacit materials shape the world around us, Beatrice? The tacit materials? Yeah, like things you can touch, like everything's always changing. How do they shape the world around us? Yeah, and your work. I am not so clear about this question. Maybe I should read it. Okay, I can skip to a different one. Um, so both you and Erica. Just to, um, sorry, Erica, just to try to answer it because I can't find it, but, um, but I think of matter rather than materials and I think of um, long temporalities and matter and how it's um, interacting with other matter and so um, in order to to imagine the world but I'm also really being really careful about the materials that I'm using to make my work and to make sure like for example and even the processes to make sure for example that they 
relate to the people that I want to talk to and not only to the language of the art world. So for example, um, in the case of the glacial erratic um, piece that I made for Rockefeller Center, for me, it was important that all these people who were not necessarily experienced sculptors could join the process because the piece was made with materials that were um, available to all of us with sacks of sand, with ro um, round ball hammers, with pliers, with vice grips, with um, torches and, and MIG welders. And so in that sense, it was really um, interesting to me to, to think about not only the materials, but the processes as, as things that are accessible to people. And because of that, they can recognize them and relate to them. Thank but you. I am not sure that I answered your question, though. <laughs> um, I, a question from Cal Poly Pomona. As a badass woman of color working in predominantly color I, uh, colonized male fields, art and academia, how do you decide which battles are worth your energy, time, and the mental drain to pursue? I'm not, I'm not very good at that. I have fought too many battles that are not worth my time but I try my best to think of fighting the battles that will allow um, my community to have a space in the future when, um, if, with regards to academia. And to, in the art world, I have been very fortunate because even though I was an artist, I mean, I since always, and I always imagined myself as an artist, and I went to my freshman year in art school in El Salvador, I wasn't able to complete my education there. I had to migrate. I had to uh, stop studying art so that I could understand why there was a war in El Salvador, et cetera. And I had to go back later to art. And so I, when I became an artist, I was already teaching at Cal State Northridge and that even though the salaries for professors are terrible, but we can um, pay our bills, make a living, have insurance. So this has allowed me, maybe not always I can make the sculptures the way that I would like to make them, or maybe I don't always have all the funding that I would like, but I don't, don't have to um, decide whether or not I have to make this work because if I believe in a work, I can make it because I have the time as long as I do it with my own labor, I can make it. So there's something very, um, that gives me a lot of independence, which is, and also stability, which is having this job as a professor. But, but I think that it also is a, it's a battle because it require, I mean, right now I'm teaching four classes and, and I'm working full time and having, I worked full time throughout the time I went to CalArts and I have been working full time for the last 21 years. And so it has been very difficult then to carve out the time to make my work. And sometimes that requires for me to work never ending hours in that, you know, I love working in my studio, so I'm able to take that on, but it's, I think in many ways, it's on the contrary, it's not so much how, what battles I have taken, but that the battles that I have taken have become important battles for others in my community and they have supported me so much that in the end, they have ended up working a lot to support the projects that I'm making. And so how it's interesting how you drag other people into your, your battles to make the work. I have a question. I think it's from Cal State at LA. Do you feel art is more crucial now than ever given the times that we're living in due to the pandemic, all the injustice and the civil unrest that's currently happening? I think art has always been important to make. And I think that um, for different reasons at different moments in history, it has been important to make and that Art has not always been understood as um, the same thing. Um, so art 
whatever it is that we are transforming it into and reinventing what it is, uh, um, is important in every moment. Perfect. And then uh, a question for Aaron. Um, what advice um, or what piece of advice would you give to a hopeful up and coming black filmmaker who's also interested in flo focusing on black stories and experiences? Um, I would say just make the work, you know, I think so often we think that we need to be invited into a certain space or accepted by a certain group of people or validated to make that work. And I feel like that consistently stops people from making their work. And um, I just believe so wholeheartedly in the spirit of just doing it, doing it first and you know, receiving whatever it is you need later. So I would just say hustle, do your thing, don't seek validation from other people and um, it will find its way in the world. Um, Beatrice, many of your pieces play with time and the concept of it. Do you feel as though your work changes the meaning for you personally over time as the work's changing? Like for, uh, with Tolkien, yeah. for example. Yes, I mean, uh, on the one hand, the, the works are inspired by the concept of time, but on the other hand, um, I think that at every moment that we approach a work of art, we might be um, going under different, living different circumstances and experiencing different things. And we always read new things. I think that reading a work is a creative act and we give it life every time we see it. And um, each person that approaches the work has different experiences with those same materials that are there. And um, because of that, you know, it's, it's a creative act. And I, I love that about um, interacting with work. That's why so many of my pieces are interactive. And I try for people to have their own experiences with them. And I think this is probably going to be our last question. Um, so, uh, uh, how should we engage with those who have acculturated, assimilated to society in regards to how the different generations of Latinx members see each other as different or treating one another as lesser than those who have been here longer? For example, for second or third generation Latinx members, um, treating each other different within time here in the United States or something else. Um, uh, I, I think that that's a question a lot about community. Like, how do we engage with different generations of the community? Yeah, I, um, I think that I will second what Erin was saying about, um, you know, not paying attention to what others say, because in every generation, people feel that they are not being understood. And, um, you know, young people have to fight to have their own voices and to um, create their own spaces and their own projects. And I think that's really important. And um, every one of us, you know, has to continue that fight. It never ends. And I wanted to just add a couple of comments um, regarding other questions that I see here. For example, um, I, don't, I don't think that people need to have my experience at all to engage with my work. I think that everyone with different experiences can engage with my work. But to me, it's important that the people that I'm talking about can engage in my work. And so, I use materials and processes and things that matter that are part of their daily life and that they will understand and relate to. And another question was, why would did we use chalk, which is an important question for me. So I wanted to just say that we use chalk because, um, well, I don't believe in permanence on the one hand, that mural will remain there forever because we have documentation of it, because we'll remember it, but also, um, we, uh, we didn't have permits 
Um, other people got permits, but we didn't have permits because we were told that because of COVID, they couldn't give us permits to ride the fund ice on the street. And so we took the street and we um, rode with chalk. And a lot of members of the community of lawyers went to, um, to accompany us. We were very grateful to all the lawyers that protected our rights of free, freedom of expression. Thank you both so much. Beatrice, is there anything else you want to comment on before we go to Rebecca? Um, no, I haven't been able to read all the questions, but um, I don't think that we have time to answer them all. I just wanted to say thank you so much to Erin and to all of you for this opportunity to speak about my work. Thank you. So on behalf of the consortium of CSU Art Galleries and Museums, we want to thank you for attending the first online event in the platform series. We are so grateful to Beatrice Cortez for sharing her work with us. And we also want to thank both Beatrice and Aaron Cristobal for this highly relevant and timely discussion. We also really want to thank Cal Poly Pomona for hosting this lecture, as well as the subcommittee, Michelle Kyrella Fillmore from CPP, Jim Sweeters and Erica Ostrander from CSUN, and myself, Rebecca Settler from CSULB. A recording of this webinar will be available in approximately two weeks when we'll share it through our mailing list and social media sites. Be sure to please attend our next Zoom webinar with Post Commodity on October 22nd at 5.30. Post Commodity is a collaboration between Cristobal Martinez and Cade L. Twist, artists that are currently based in California. As an interdisciplinary art collective, their work critiques the violent manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions and belief systems that represent the colonizing and destabilizing forces of the 21st century. Their shared lens and voices also conduct, connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with a broader public sphere. The final event for 2020 will occur on Thursday, November 12th at noon and include a presentation by Forensic Architecture founder E.L. Wiseman. A London-based artist collective, Forensic Architecture undertakes advanced spatial and media investigations into cases of human rights violations with and on behalf of communities affected by political violence, human rights organizations, international prosecutors, environmental justice groups, and media organizations. To end our evening, we want to thank you again for attending, and we hope you are able to attend future platform events. Thanks so much to Erin and, and Beatrice. Thank you.